Good morning to all and welcome to the Sea Level Rise, Why We Need Nature-Based Adaptations being presented by Sierra Club Loma Prieta Chapter, San Francisco Bay Chapter, and the Redwood Chapter. I want to thank you all for joining us today on this very important subject that should be of interest and practicality to all of you. I want to welcome the attendees, our honored guests, and our expert presenters. Start with a quote that many of you, most of you have probably heard. Sir David Attenborough said, what we do now and in the next few years will profoundly affect the next few thousand years. This is particularly relevant to the San Francisco Bay. So I'll repeat this one. What we do now and in the next few years will profoundly affect <clears throat> the next few thousand years. So we must seize the day. The Sierra Club recognizes that what we do to protect and restore the San Francisco Bay now and in the next few years will profoundly affect not only our local nature, but also our local residents for centuries. This is the legacy that will be left by local elected officials, agency heads, and their staff. So what do you want your legacy to be? For that reason, I'm proud to introduce the Sierra Club Bay 2030 webinar organized by the Loma Prieta chapter, covers San Mateo, Santa Clara, and San Benito counties also by the San Francisco Bay chapter that includes San Francisco, Marin, Alameda, and Contra Costa counties, and the Redwood chapter, which includes the Bay adjacent Napa, Sonoma, and Solano counties. Federal, state, and local agencies all agree that resilient solutions are needed for an unpredictable future. And while greenhouse gas reduction is absolutely critical to slow climate change, sea level rise is already a fact. The Ocean Protection Council and state guidance is that we should be planning for a three and a half foot rise by 2050. These projections, however, always show an acceleration. Therefore, this webinar is important to provide factual information, including the science and the funding. We will provide decision makers with information about best solutions for a variety of base situations in different places around the Bay. While we recognize that cities and other entities have a responsibility and a need for information in order to make long range decisions, how should they be equipped to do this? How are these decisions best made? What is needed for your specific entity? And what has worked around the Bay? And of course, critically, how is it funded? In this webinar series, we'll explore these questions, answers, and different strategies. Remember that this is a three part series and the link that you use today um, will work for all three uh, webinars. We are humbled by the impressive array of speakers from agencies and organizations that have agreed to partic participate in these three webinars, and because they also recognize the importance of the topic and the need to supply sound information. We profoundly thank them for their generosity, uh, to share their expertise for the benefit of our region, and we truly acknowledge them as great local environmental leaders. To that point, I'm honored to introduce our first presenter, Jean Bourgeois, Deputy Operating Officer at the Wa of Watershed Stewardship and Planning at Valley Water. Good morning. Thank you, James, for that introduction. Um, yeah, I'd like to second the, uh, the, the great panel that you guys have pulled together in this webinar series, and I'm honored to be a part of it and to be able to kick it off. I titled my talk, Welcome to San Francisco Bay. Um, as my, my last name may have given you a little clue, I'm, I'm originally from South Louisiana, got Cajun blood and um, did my graduate work and early career there. And as you can imagine, there are quite a few wetland issues in South Louisiana, but I've been living and working in San Francisco Bay for the past 23 plus years. And um, I want, I know we all live and work in the area, but I wanna give you kind of a tour of San Francisco Bay from my perspective as a restoration practitioner. I currently work with Valley Water. But I've worn a, a number of hats around San Francisco Bay, including serving um, over nine years as the executive project manager for the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. And so I typically like to start my presentations with this image. So this is a, a photograph uh, taken around the turn of the last century. And scrawled across the back was a good day's bag. And you can see the number of ducks strung around this hunter's neck. Um, this was in the South Bay. And I, I like to start off with this to kind of humanize the experience of P that people had with San Francisco Bay. There are multiple written accounts 
of what the bay was like back then. And there, they say that the, when the birds would take off from the bay, the sky would blacken. This was an incredible resource. Um, and it's because there was a vast amount of tidal wetlands present in San Francisco Bay. Um, this is some great historical ecology work done from, by SFEI showing the, the historic extent, extent of what these marshlands used to be. Um, but more than just the marshlands, the bay itself used to be more a part of our everyday lives here, right? The bay, we are the bay area. The bay is why we're here. Uh, it was a big part of commerce and trade and recreation and sustenance. It really was a part of people's everyday lives here. And we've kind of gotten away from that over time. And as a result, um, we've ended up mistreating our bay through the years. We've uh, lost 85 to 90% of those tidal wetlands. We've drained the wetlands for agriculture. We've flooded them for salt production. We've filled them for development. Uh, and we had quite a bit of loss. Uh, we also treated it as a dumping ground, not just filling for development, but also this is where we put our garbage. This is where we pump our raw sewage um, and, and really uh, transformed the way we interact with the Bay to the point where it wasn't so much, it was kind of an out of sight, out of mind. Uh, we built bridges around it, roads, you know, bridges over it, roads around it. Uh, it became less and less a part of our, our collective uh, psyche. Uh, and there were even some very radical plans proposed to just completely dam it off. Um, and all of this, as all of this was happening, um, it sparked an environmental movement. Uh, these three women in Berkeley who founded Save the Bay saw what was going on and uh, uh, really understood the value of the bay. And one of the, the big lessons that I think they had to convey to people was helping them understand why the bay is important. So I feel like we still are having that conversation today. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time uh, talking about why we should care about San Francisco Bay. The obvious answer is the habitat answer, right? As a restoration ecologist, uh, I get that a lot. Uh, people think that large scale wetland restoration is something that you know is a luxury. It's a nice to have, it's not a must have. When times are good, um, we can, allocate some resources for fish and wildlife habitat and recreation, et cetera. But it's much more than that. And you'll see, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll understand that uh, it, it is much more than that. But there are significant uh, environmental reasons to do these large scale wetland restorations. We've got endangered species that are endemic to San Francisco Bay, but also um, the San Francisco Bay Delta, that system is the largest estuary on the West Coast, not of the United States, but of the entire North and South America. So it has been deemed uh, an estuary of hemispheric importance. And if you're ever out there on the bay during uh, the migration season, you'll, you'll, get a, you'll get a flavor, a taste of what it's like and how, how rich and abundant the wildlife is out there. And it's also surrounded by seven and a half million people, right? Um, I think during the pandemic, it's really highlighted how important our outdoor open spaces are to our mental health and uh, part, of our, um, part of our society here. And so um, having that as a resource for the human inhabitants of the Bay is important as well. But like I said, wetlands provide more than just fish and wildlife habitat. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we haven't always treated our Bay well as far as water quality, uh, dumping our garbage and our sewage and uh, chemicals, et cetera, into the Bay. And so there's an extensive tracking process this is from the State of the Estuary Report, uh, looking at the ecological health. And wetlands are a big component of being able to uh, help restore ecological health and filter out contaminants. So this is a really uh, a, a great a benefit of having uh, large scale wetlands in the system. They really can help improve water quality. So if you care about water quality, you should also care about wetlands. And finally, if none of that really resonates with you, um, I hope this will, because we really have uh, an opportunity here in front of us. And the wetlands can be part of a flood protection strategy. They allow for flood storage as well as shoreline protection. We live in a very complex mosaic at the edge of the bay. We have uh, habitats, we have flood risk intermingled with commerce and industry and infrastructure and people's homes. And it really is a complex interface. And as we go through 
these past few years, we've witnessed on television these you know, horrific flooding events that are happening with these storms all over the country. But we have a pretty short memory because there are areas right here that are at risk and, and have uh, significant uh, history of flooding. And so this is not an abstract thing that can happen elsewhere. This has been happening for us and we need to be prepared for it. And it's not just uh, low-lying communities. It's also a lot of our tech industry. Uh, the, the heart of our economy has been built up in areas uh, along the edge of the bay that are, going, that are either at risk now or are going to be at risk in future sea level rise scenarios. So there is a big strong economic driver to make sure that we protect um, uh, all of the resources. This is an image that showed up in the front of the New York Times after Hurricane Sandy. Um, uh, it was one of these possible solutions, like how do we protect Manhattan from these, this big storm surge? And wetlands, wetlands were part of the conversation then. And I think this is a, a great uh, highlight of, of the benefit of wetlands in attenuating some flood risk. But I have to say, San Francisco Bay is, is in a much better position where we actually have the space to accommodate large scale wetland restoration. And a lot of that is happening right now. So we have an unprecedented opportunity in front of us. And one point I really wanna drive home is that with sea level rise, uh, marshes can actually grow. They are in a dynamic equilibrium with the bay. If there is enough sediment supply in the bay, marshes can keep pace. They can grow in elevation and expand um, to accommodate changes in sea level rise. So that's a nice adaptation of these marshes that we need to keep in, in, into uh, consideration. And what does that mean for flood protection? Well, uh, on, the, on the left is a, is a conceptual model showing, you know, if you have extensive marsh areas in front of your uh, flood protection systems, uh, they help attenuate the waves and absorb some of that energy. And you can actually have a little bit lower levy and you actually dramatically reduce your O&M costs to operate and maintain. The, the pictures on the right are from San Francisco Bay. You can see levee systems where you have marshes in front of them and where you don't. And you can see the rock and the erosion on that face when you don't have um, marshes in front of you. And so it really drives up your, your operations and maintenance costs. And this is the concept that you may have heard called the horizontal levee, right? This is a, a gradual slope into this zone of habitats placed on the bay side of your flood protection levee or conversely, moving your levee to a place to accommodate this transition zone, right? This has also been called an ecotone or a, a upland transition zones or a horizontal levee. And it, it's, I'm happy to report that there are a lot of large scale wetland restorations happening around the Bay right now. So we're seeing a lot of progress. We really are in a Renaissance uh, moving away from trying to conserve every square foot of precious habitat to now really broadening out and doing some large scale wetland restoration and making changes at a landscape scale. But we are not without our challenges. And um, it was mentioned already, but sea level rise is a big one. Um, to get these marshes, um, they can keep pace with sea level rise, but we need to give them as much of a head start as possible and get them established. And there's another side of the coin here. I mentioned it, for those marshes to be able to keep pace with sea level rise, we need to have enough suspended sediment in the system, right? So that those marshes can grow as the seas rise. And so we're potentially facing this double whammy of decreased sediment supply and increasing um, sea level rise. So this is something that we really need to take into account because it's not just about restoring a certain place in time. It's not about a single marsh. It's about restoring all of the processes that are in place. We need to look upland, we need to look out into the bay and make sure we are restoring complete systems and that the processes are in place so that we can ensure uh, sustainable habitats and, and so that we can reap those benefits over time. Now, San Francisco Bay has long been known as a place of innovation. Um, and I think this also applies to what we're seeing on the sea level rise front. Um, there have been any number of planning documents going back decades of people already starting to think about, uh, think about these situations. And in particular, I want to call your attention to the 1999 Valence Ecosystem Habitat Goals Report. 
This was kind of a groundbreaking regional planning effort where if you were doing a project in your corner of the bay, you could go to this report, find out what the priorities are, and the goal would be that all of these projects could then add up to something greater at a bay level scale. But 1999 was a long time ago. We have since updated that report, uh, by we I mean collectively the, the community um, in San Francisco Bay, um, with the 2015 uh, Balance Ecosystem Habitat Gold Science Update, which specifically um, was put in place to address climate change, which was not, it was mentioned in the 1999 report, but not, you know, our understanding of it has dramatically changed. And if you take nothing else from my talk, uh, I really want you to take home these three points. Um, these are kind of the major take home points of that uh, update to the Balin's Ecosystem Goals Report. And this is where kind of the innovative and progressive thinking of the area comes in. First, we need to restore complete systems. We need to restore the processes that are in place so that these habitats can sustain. Secondly, we need to act with a sense of urgency, right? We are racing the clock against that sea level rise curve. The sooner we get these habitats uh, in place and functioning, the better chance we have that they will be sustainable into the future and persist. And lastly, we need to plan for areas for these baylands to migrate. And so this is a complicated issue, but um, you know that can look like a lot of different things. It can mean finding areas where we have open space so we can create those large transition zones. It potentially means artificially creating some large transition zones so that the marshes can migrate upslope, or maybe even rethinking some of our planning efforts around the bay to make sure that we are not putting people in harm's way in the future. Uh, but we need to make sure that, you know, with sea level rise coming, that we plan for the migration of these balins. And so how do we get this done? Um, there has been a lot of uh, personal um, and, you know, professional thought that's gone into a lot of these strategies but where the rubber meets the road is getting things in the ground. Fortunately, San Francisco Bay has responded yet again. Um, the, the state legislature developed something called the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, and they put together a funding uh, package and the voters overwhelmingly supported it. It was a, a nine county parcel tax passed with over 70% approval. So we have a half a billion dollars coming in for these types of projects. So this is a great source of local funding. It can also be used to leverage state and federal grant programs. So we do have um, a, a huge commitment uh, that was you know, passed by the voters for uh, investment in these types of projects. And another point I'd like to make is that, and this is often overlooked, is that this investment also means jobs. Right. Uh, sometimes the perception of restoration is, you know, school kids planting native plants on the edge of the bay. And while those sort of community based restoration programs are vitally important for education and getting people to understand the dynamics of the bay. Um, some of these larger scale projects, these are massive construction projects. Right. So this is this is something I'd like to get people thinking about as ecosystems as infrastructure. So when you talk about infrastructure jobs. Um, uh, restoration falls right into that category, in my opinion. Uh, these, these systems provide flood benefits, water quality benefits, habitat benefits, public access benefits, and uh, these, are, these are massive construction jobs. And finally, um, I want to talk about partnerships. It takes a lot of people and a lot of energy to get these projects underway. Um, in the past, uh, perhaps we have all um, stayed in our corners and fought for our, our little corner of the bay or our pet projects, but we're running out of time uh, and partnerships are important. I feel like the, the private sector, the agencies, academia, um, those with land use authority, we all need to make sure we're rowing in the same direction. Uh, I, I like to pop this slide up when I was working up the South Bay Salt Ponds project. This is just a small fraction of the number of entities that were involved in making that one project. It's a very large project, um, but a lot of entities are, are vital to making sure that project gets implemented. And I think this can only be expanded when we start looking at the broader bay. 
So it, it, there are people out there that are working on this, that are thinking about this. If anyone is, is pondering a project, there are plenty of resources and plenty of people willing to help and start to make connections for these partnerships. Um, because I think at the end of the day, when we have a thriving and healthy and resilient Bay, it benefits all of us. And I think we, we all wanna see this vision achieved, um, but we are racing the clock. And so I hope that little introduction to the Bay and these issues will set the stage for the speakers to follow in these coming webinars. And with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you, John. Ça c'est bon. We appreciate that. First, I'd like to remind our participants uh, that the there is a Q&A box in your Zoom. Please feel free to list your questions there for the presenters. Um, we'll ask them to address those questions during the panel time. Um, next, I would like to introduce Julie Beagle. She has recently joined the San Francisco District of the Army Corps of Engineers as the environmental planning team lead. Thanks, thanks for having me. Gosh, John, such a great introduction. Um, hard to follow, but I think that really set the stage. So I'm Julie Beagle, thanks for having me. I'm a geomorphologist and I've worked in the San Francisco estuary and the watersheds of California for the last 15 years or so. And I recently made a huge leap from the San Francisco Estuary Institute to the Army Corps of Engineers. And I'll talk a little bit about what I hope to accomplish in doing that. I wake up thinking about climate resilience and adaptation to coastal flooding, and I feel very honored to get to work in this community that John described every day. But I do want to make clear that my talk today, I'm representing work that I did with many collaborators at SFEI. I'll touch a little bit on kind of where I see the Army Corps going as a partner in this work. But really, I'm representing my own work as a scientist in this field and the way I see that we can move forward in the way that John described by harnessing the power of nature instead of fighting against it and describe one of the tools among many that I think can be helpful in moving us forward, moving the ball down the field. Oh, I need to make sure I can advance the slides and I can. Um, so we've heard of this before. Uh, I don't think you can see enough pictures and I know you've all seen this. You know, sea level rise is happening. You heard, you've heard that many times already. And it's happening quicker than we think. Um, more and more papers come out every day talking about the ice sheets. And this may not be sea, you know, you can see it at certain times of the month in the king tides, the winter and the summer, but it's a reality that we need to address now. But I think, you know, John said a really great, a really great background. I'm gonna give us um, another take on kind of how did we get here? And the reason I talk about this is it matters kind of the transition that we've seen the Bay go through why are we in the position that we're in today? And that sets the stage for why nature-based adaptation, nature-based measures may be our, one of our best opportunities to adapting to sea level rise. So history number, you know, number one, and you heard John talk about this, history matters. So we built on top of the Baylands and in floodplains, we filled them in, and now those areas are sinking and more, uh, more flood prone. And so here's this uh, picture of the, tidal wetlands around the 1800s, and we, we diked them and we built on top of them in many different ways. Sometimes we piled on top, sometimes we dug out around the sides, but many of our cities, many of our communities are built on top of former marshes. We have a, you know way less tidal marshes today than we did before, and here's a comparison. And as John said, there's been a ton of work going on um, to restore many of them, but many of our communities are really on top of those far, former marshes in our below sea level. So some of those areas subsided so severely and are now protected by fragile levees. And some of us have started calling them polders. This is a term to describe low-lying areas that have were formerly balans that have been diked and are now below sea level. And so this is a, uh, something that we're familiar with when we heard about Hurricane Katrina, but we have our own version of that here. Many low-lying areas that are very flood prone. It's also really important to point out that we have a huge history of inequality in the Bay. You all know about this, but redlining forced historically marginalized communities to live in the lowest lying areas that flood the most regularly and often don't have adequate flood protection. And so I think it's really important to center the equity conversation when we talk about sea level rise adaptation. Sea level rise is only one part of the problem. And it's, water's gonna come from all sides. We have, 
increased precipitation from atmospheric rivers, we have rising groundwater, and many of these are not incorporated into the models that we use to predict our vulnerability. And so our water is coming from the ground, it's coming from the sea, it's also coming from our watersheds. I'll get here at the end, but a wall is not going to solve that problem. We need to think holistically at the watershed scale about how we're going to adapt. This isn't a problem, it's just something to consider, is that in general, you know, individual jurisdictions have pursued shoreline planning separately. I have land use authority in this area, you have land use authority in this area, and so we're going to go one by one. This is not going to get us where we need to go with sea level rise. We have an enclosed bay. We really need a regional approach because we know that sea level rise is not going to stop at our city boundaries. Water knows no bounds. It doesn't know that on your side of the river or my side of the river, we need to figure out ways to work together. And we really have a choice to make. You know, we could individually all put up our own walls, reflect water back towards our neighbors, or we could think of a different way to do this. And one of those ways is incorporating nature-based adaptation into the way we think about climate adapt uh, uh, the way we think about climate resilience. Can we use appropriate actions that harness biodiversity and ecosystem services across a spectrum from eelgrass and oysters in the water, mudflats and marshes in the inner tidal, up to that horizontal levy that John talked about to migration space? These are gonna be a range from you know, planting eelgrass to a flood risk levy with a horizontal levy in front of it. There's many ways to combine these ideas to provide the multiple benefits that we know we want and to plan at the scale that makes the most sense for our bay. So we have this challenge here with local land use planning. We sort of know how vulnerable we are, although it's important to point out that groundwater and fluvial flooding are not incorporated. What's, how do we transition from understanding how vulner, vulnerable we are to what should we do about it? We know there's a lot of interest in our community for nature-based options, but where are they appropriate? How big do they need to be? How can we work together to use them? And then this challenge about going it alone. How can we figure out a scale that makes sense to work together to confer the most resilience on our system? So at SFEI, with many partners over the last several years, we work to develop a framework or a process, a set of tools that could help our region kind of move the ball from the Balin goals and all those planning documents that Don showed you, move the ball to kind of being a little more spatially explicit about where could we use some of these nature-based adaptation measures to make that transition. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we did that and what that tool is. So there are three steps. One is instead of planning using our traditional boundaries, in our traditional cities and flood control districts, could we plan using nature's boundaries? And what would that look like? It's a cra crazy idea, but I, it might work. How can we identify nature-based measures that could work well in a given place that are suited to the physical and ecological processes that are acting in that particular area? And then how do we use that to bring together stakeholders? So you know from living here that the bay, the shoreline looks really different in different places. This is not a one size fits all situation. In some areas, we have steep cliffs and steep bluffs moving down into deep, deep water, like here in Marin. In other places, you have long alluvial valleys with subsided areas, with big areas that were historically marshes, large river systems coming into them. You know, it sort of makes sense intuitively that different types of solutions will fit in different places. So the first thing we did was to define those geomorphic units or to define the ways that the shoreline meets the bay. So there's those headlands and small valleys in Marin, Contra Costa. We have wide alluvial valleys in the north and the south, Petaluma, Sonoma, Napa, meeting the bay in these broad, broad areas of tidal marsh historically. And then along the, along the edges of our fault, we have alluvial fans kind of pushing into the bay. Um, and that makes a different kind of series of slopes of how does the, of the shoreline grade into wider mudflats and down into the deep bay. So, you know, even though I love that picture that John showed about Manhattan with marshes at the end, sometimes I use that as, as an example to say, let's not put a marsh at the edge of Manhattan or at the edge of San Francisco because the water is so deep, the waves are so intense, that's not going to be a place where our marshes are going to be suitable. Let's focus 
our marshes in the places where the wave climate, the sediment climate are more likely to succeed. And that's what this tool tried to do. This is another view of how the shoreline meets the deep water. And again, you can see the dark blue along San Francisco. Um, when there's a big drop off like that, that may not be the best place to try to, to, try to uh, there might be different solutions along the San Francisco shoreline than big wide tidal marshes. So we came up with this concept called nature's boundaries or operational landscape units, breaking down the shoreline and the watersheds that meet the shoreline um, by those geomorphic units, almost like keeping the watershed concept going all the way down to the bay. We developed 30 of these. Um, and these are areas that are shared, that share geophysical and land use characteristics that may be suited for a particular suite of nature-based measures. This is the scale that are hydrologically connected. Um, they go up to one of the highest sea level rise scenarios that there is. So it's pretty inclusive and they go out into the bay um, to account for all the subtidal measures that are really important for breaking waves, for providing habitat in our subtidal environments. This is what we're hoping is a scale that if we work together in the scale, what, what happens in one part of an OLU or operational landscape unit affects the other part. We need to work together. Once we had those 30 landscape units, we looked at a huge range of adaptation measures. On the left, we looked at nature-based measures from oyster reefs to submerged aquatic vegetation, all the way up to um, the way our creeks meet the bay. We also looked at regulatory, financial, um, and policy tools that could be used, non-structural options that can be used in coordination. And we started to map them. So here's a, before I get into that, here's a couple examples. You saw some of them, these in John's talks, but we have really great examples of many of these already. These are types of measures that are suitable to our bay. Oysters, the Living Shorelines Project that the Coastal Conservancy has been doing. There are a few examples of ecotone or horizontal levees. Um, another thing that's really exciting is we have a number of coarse beach projects. The, be the bay used to be have a number of different types of beaches and different orientations with different grain sizes. Um, and we've started now to restore some of those to use beaches as a way to adapt to sea level rise and soften our shorelines to absorb energy instead of reflecting it. So we started mapping these. We know that all these ideas are out there. We know that they're suitable to the bay, but where? How big do they need to be? How wide? Where are they most suitable given the geophysical processes that we know exist? And so for example, marsh restoration. There's been a ton of work on marsh restoration, but we looked at the elevations. Where are there areas that are at the right elevation now for, that could support a marsh if it was exposed to the tides? And how wide does it need to be to knock down waves? So not just where could it be, but how wide would it need to be to actually do a flood protection job also? Not just a habitat job, a flood protection. There's so many jobs that our wetlands can do if we can get them in the right places. We also looked at migration space. This is what John was talking about, one of the key messages of the Balin Goals. Where are the places where our marshes can migrate? We have such an urbanized estuary, but are there some places left that we could buy, that we could protect, that we could make into a park that could become an area in the long term for as the seas rise, could our marshes migrate? And so we tried to identify areas that were protected and unprotected at the right elevations. So as I said, we mapped a, a, a wide variety of these, of these measures and tried to put them together um, with, by each of the OLU. So on the left, you can see here's the long list of 30 operational landscape units. And on the top, here are those measures that we mapped. Um, and we tried to rank their suitability. So this is not a tool to say, here's what you should do. It's here's what you could do. Here's the a filter down set of options that may work better in your particular area, in your particular OLU. And here's the scale that may work the best if you can pull all those people together. Um, and so uh, another thing is that we worked with SPUR, which is an incredible think tank in San Francisco, to think about the land use types that are kind of on the, on the dry side. You know, our bay is very dense, but it varies. And so in each of these land use types, Spur identified different types of policy approaches, easements, buyouts, different types of zoning tools that may be suitable given the land use constraints and opportunities to use in combination with those nature-based approaches. And here's a list of some of them. So what that adds up to is a 
spatially explicit map or framework or opportunity, set of opportunities for each area of the bay. And so here's an example of one of those opportunity areas. And it shows here are the different types of nature-based measures that may be appropriate. And here are the different types of non-structural options that may be appropriate. Here's another example at Richardson Bay. And again, it's not a, this is not a plan to say, here's what you should do, but here are the types of things that may work in different areas and let's consider them. Once you have that set of opportunities, they need to be put together into a strategy. And so, you know, can you take several of those options, given your land use constraints, given funding, given partnerships, and put them together to say, okay, here's, we're going to do mudflat augmentation. We're going to let the marsh migrate. We're going to buy out this land. And then how do you put that into a time frame? We can't do all of this at once. You know, as John mentioned, this all costs a lot of money. There's a there's a ton that needs to be considered into actually putting these projects in the ground, but where can we start now? Let's say we start by adding beaches or sediment recharge, and then as sea level rises, where do we know we need to go? We need to acquire a transition zone. And it could be that later down the road, we have to really change our land uses. But if we can put our thinking into an adaptation pathway, that starts to get the wheels turning of what can we do now? What do we need to start to plan for? And how do we have those conversations with communities? So how can this be used? I like to joke that as a scientist, a lot of our work sits on the shelf for a long time. And this in particular, the Adaptation Atlas, felt useful to people right away. I think as a community, we were looking for ways to say, how can we work together? How can we look up shore and down shore and you know, up the creek and into the bay, how can we look around us and figure out who, who we need to be working together with? And so that's one option is bringing people together by these operational landscape units and figuring out how can we bring more partners to the table, bring more funding to the table, create a bigger vision for our, for our, um, for our shoreline. This has also helped provide guidance for policy changes for regional agencies. How can some of the agencies, you know, many of these, you know, many of these solutions haven't been permittable because it, it, it requires filling the bay in such, to some degree or using sediment. So where is that most appropriate? Another pretty interesting application is it provides a spatial tool for us to assess kind of how do we prioritize our land use decisions moving forward. You all know this very well, but you know, there's areas that right now are being considered for housing. And this is an area in Newark. It's also an area that was, we mapped as one of 10% of the uh, migration space in the Bay. And it's an area that is um, currently at the elevation to support marshes. Now, these are decisions that need to happen at the city level, you know, but it points to the fact that we need a regional approach. How do we provide housing that is needed for communities, but not housing that will be that will that will be flooded in the in the short term? Now, I will say that all of these things that I just talked about need sediment. They all require more mud to keep, have marshes keep pace with sea level rise, to build horizontal levees, to augment mud flats. And the Army Corps of Engineers dredges navigation channels and has access to a lot of the mud that we will need as a community to use nature-based approaches. Right now, it is cheaper to take the material offshore, but we need to figure out ways to reuse that sediment in a smart way and collaboratively if we want to design with nature for climate resilience. And so this is part of the reason that I made the switch to the Army Corps. I'm hoping to help our community reuse sediment so that we can give our marshes a fighting chance, not just for our marshes, for the communities behind them, and figure out ways to not have each individual city go it alone. Because if that happens, our communities that have been disproportionately marginalized will continue. Um, and we see that happening now with the communities that are able to build walls now, that are able to float bonds and protect themselves, and some communities aren't. One of the other goals of the operational landscape unit is that it forces us to work together, it forces us to acknowledge that our bay is interconnected and we need to all move forward together. One thing that I'm very excited about at the Army Corps is this 
opportunity I have to lead a program called Engineering with Nature. This is the Army Corps speak for saying nature-based adaptation or process-based adaptation. And it's this idea that we wanna to run to where the ball is going to be. So where can we create those landscape features that will have the most value in the, in the future? And how can we use local knowledge and systems thinking? And so my goal is to try to take the adaptation atlas and all the work that our community has done over the last several decades that John talked about and I've touched on and try to build out this ability for us to reuse the sediment in a smart and nature-based way. One example of this that we're working on right now is an idea called shallow water placement. It's beneficially reusing material, placing sediment in the near shore and letting natural transport processes move material onshore. This has been talked about for years and years and years. It's been done in other places, but it is new to the Bay. There's a lot that needs to be that needs to go into it, but can we use the natural processes of tides and currents to help resuspend sediment and give our marshes and mudflats a boost? This is something that we're working on now and that I feel really excited to try to push forward and pilot in the Bay. So this is my last slide. I think we can adapt to sea level rise if we add more tools to our toolbox. I think the shallow water placement is one idea of that. We need to speed up, as John said. We only have a certain amount of years before our marshes are not gonna be able to keep pace with sea level rise if they don't have a boost. Design with nature, center communities, and most importantly, work together. Sorry for going long and thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Julie. I wanna remind our participants that you can enter, uh, submit your questions through the Q&A on your Zoom uh, window and those will be addressed during the panel section after our next speaker. And now I'm delighted to introduce Julian Wood. He's the San Francisco Bay Program Leader at Point Blue Conservation Science. Take it away, Julian. Thank you. Thank you, James. And it's great to be here. Um, thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be able to present to you. I'm going to be talking about the importance of the Bay's habitats to migratory and resident birds. And I think this will uh, follow up nicely on John and Julie's presentation. And so that's really just one of the key messages there, the importance of the Bay uh, for birds. I also want to talk about how sea level rise threatens the Bay's biodiversity and how nature-based adaptation to sea level rise can benefit our birds and our human communities. So first, a little bit uh, uh, about me. I'm the San Francisco Bay program leader for Point Blue Conservation Science, and I lead a variety of bird monitoring and research uh, projects, all aimed at understanding bird population trends and status, and also habitat needs. And I take those, uh, take our results to um, improve uh, restoration planning uh, and management of our bays, uh, wetlands, and shoreline. So, I don't want to uh, belabor this point, but uh, as, as both Julie and John have already uh, talked about, we have lost uh, well over 80% of our historic uh, tidal marsh. So a marsh that looked uh, very much like this one used to completely surround uh, our bay. And this, has, this loss has had a really dramatic effect on uh, bird populations, of course, that rely on this habitat. So some of these uh, species that you see down here, th this is the only place that, that they live. So the common yellowthroat, the song sparrow, all of these species here have endemic subspecies that exist only in tidal marsh and only in San Francisco Bay. So if we lose this marsh, we lose these populations for good. And so that, that's pretty serious. And Valerie is going to talk a little bit later about the Ridgeways rail, uh, federally threatened uh, endangered species. And we also have the black rail, which is a state uh, threatened species. So some of the other uh, habitats that we had uh, or still have in the Bay, but have lost a, a great deal of over 40% of the tidal flat has been lost. Now at first glance, this might not look like particularly uh, productive habitat, but this is really important for shorebirds. And you've probably seen uh, huge flocks of shorebirds uh, when you're driving, uh, driving along the highway and looking out over the bay uh, or walking along the shoreline. Most of these shorebirds rely on the bay over the, over the winter. That's when uh, the vast majority of them are here and they feed on the invertebrates in the, in, in the mud. 
in these tidal flats. And a couple of these species, the stilts and the avocets, <clears throat> are actually resident. So they stick around and they breed. And we also shouldn't forget uh, that raptors are also uh, depend on these tidal flats because they prey on, um, on the shorebirds. So it does support um, a community. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we have managed to save. And, and I think John uh, touched on this. Uh, our, our, our Bay community continues to support efforts to keep the Bay healthy and clean. And we've invested in protection and restoration. So we've made great progress in getting back some of that habitat that, that we lost. And we're also smarter about managing what's left so that we can maximize the benefits to shorebirds and waterfall uh, and uh, waterfall. And so, yeah, in short, you know, re restoration works. We've seen this happen uh, in multiple places throughout the Bay. We're very lucky that, that this does work so well. It's a proven technique um, in the Bay. And we have seen birds like this, uh, like the endangered Ridgeways rail, come back to areas that were formerly uh, hay fields. And this is one of those, this is one of those sites um, that has uh, evolved into a healthy tidal marsh. So uh, we, know, we know it works. And we've also, because of our um, protection uh, efforts uh, to date, this, uh, the San Francisco Bay is a site of hemispheric importance for uh, shorebirds. Over a million shorebirds pass through the San Francisco Bay uh, each year, many of them uh, spending the winter here, but some of them just pa uh, passing through on their migration and fueling the rest of their migration and their, and their breeding. So it's a, a hugely important place for shorebirds. It's also a wetland of international importance as designated by the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. And that's due in part to those, to those shorebirds, but also the waterfowl, the ducks, uh, tens of thousands of ducks also use the bay. Again, mostly in the winter, though some species and individuals uh, are here year round. And there are other, other habitat types, too many that to, for me to get into in this talk, uh, but that are very important to uh, a diverse waterbird community here in the Bay. So these, uh, these are just some of, my, some of my favorites. Each one of these species kind of depends on a slightly different habitat type uh, within the Bay. And we're lucky to have uh, these habitat types in the Bay. And it's really this, uh, this tapestry of different habitat types, this mosaic that, that makes the San Francisco Bay such an important place for birds. And again, there's, there's many habitat types and many different bird species that I'm not uh, going to get into now. So, you know, the big question is what's going to happen to all these habitats with, uh, with sea level rise? I'm going to uh, just highlight some of, the, some, of the, some of them that are uh, under the most threat. And that's, of course, tidal flats. As, as waters deepen, wave energy is going to increase and be, potentially begin to erode uh, these tidal flats. Again, unless we get enough sediment, have enough sediment coming in um, to protect those areas. And that has huge inf implication for those, for those million uh, plus shorebirds that use the bay. Another habitat is tidal marsh, of course, that is highly susceptible to uh, sea level rise. And as the waters increase, these uh, birds are going to have a harder time finding cover from predators. So they're going to be uh, really impacted. Now, I should mention, of course, that tidal marshes are dynamic, as, as, as John and Julie pointed to. They can keep pace with sea level rise, but they do need sediment in order to do that. And some of our uh, earlier work has shown that if we are looking at uh, higher rates of sea level rise and if uh, we get decreasing sediment supplies, we could lose up to 90% of these tidal marshes. So there's a good chance that these marshes will need our help and will need additional sediment uh, to keep pace with sea level rise. Subtidal habitat, another, um, another threatened habitat, and this is, is important for birds like the black uh, oyster catcher that feeds on, on, uh, on the mussels and the oyster beds and also ducks, sea ducks that forage uh, in eelgrass beds that could be threatened by rising 
sea levels. And really all, all of these shallow water habitats that we're talking about are, are highly at risk. Many of these are protected by very uh, low earthen uh, non-structural levees that are costly to maintain. And it's really gonna be important to figure out ways to integrate these types of habitats into uh, flood planning, um, flood risk reduction strategies so that we can maintain this habitat for shorebirds and uh, use these habitats to protect us from sea level rise and storms. So just to give you an idea of what, what this looks like when a tidal marsh floods and becomes inundated, this is one of the extreme events. So you can see normally this would be uh, covered in vegetation, but there's very little vegetation left here for birds to uh, hide in. And we can have uh, Ridgeway's rails, for example, um, being very exposed to predation. They don't fly very well, uh, and so they're very, very susceptible. So that's the impacts to, uh, to the wildlife, to birds, but of course also has, sea level rise has big impacts for our human communities. And right now it's, you know, most of what we have seen and experienced is, has been more like nuisance flooding, uh, like roads flooding, but uh, this is becoming increasingly serious and, you know, people's lives are going to be at risk. So it's a real, it's a big question. How, how are we going to respond um, to this? And uh, will we first consider solutions that benefit both birds and people? I think that's why, you know, that's why we're all here today to think about that very important question. And here's a, a, a photo that kind of illustrates uh, some of these, some of these points. Um, there's a lot going on in, in, in this picture here. Um, in the foreground, you see some native marsh uh, vegetation that can be used by some of those species uh, that, I, that I mentioned, like the song sparrow and the yellowthroat. And then in the background, and, and that pilot marsh is, is helping to protect uh, the levee that we're standing on here. And in the background, you can see that we're continuing to build uh, right up to the edge of the shoreline. And of course, as, as Julie mentioned, that's not even the uh, original shoreline, which was behind those buildings. Uh, so these, this area is, is at risk. Now there's some hope here in, in this photo as well. This is a South Bay Salt Pond uh, restoration project here. So uh, this uh, tidal flat is starting to uh, accrete and the marsh is growing and can continue to uh, further protect uh, further protect these levees uh, from erosion. So it's, you know, the question is where, where can we implement these kinds of projects? We have limited dollars. And uh, as Julie mentioned, uh, you know, these, not every solution will fit uh, in, in every place. One of the things that uh, we are doing is trying to figure out to layer on top of that where these restoration solutions best benefit uh, tidal marsh birds, for example. So we we use our uh, we use our bird data. This is an example of uh, a 25 year data set that we have on tidal wetland birds collected from all over the bay, and you know we're we're using that information to find out what are the areas in the bay that are most important for birds, both now and potentially in the future. So just to give you one example of what that looks like, this is a priority, uh, prioritization map from our Future Marches viewer that looks at areas that are important uh, to birds. And you can see these circled areas, the darker colors are areas that are, uh, that are important for birds not only now, but also in the future, especially if we are able to allow um, marshes to increase into those uh, subsided areas by removing levees and allowing the tidal marshes to, uh, to restore in those areas. And it's kind of behind my, live, my video feed here, but just to zoom in to uh, Sistoon Marsh. So this, uh, is also uh, our modeling has shown that this area 
uh, here is also really important um, for birds, both uh, now and particularly in the future. This is a screenshot from the adaptation atlas that uh, Julie presented. And these orange areas are, are, uh, are currently uplands, but they could become tidal marsh in the future if we simply allow the water to move up onto that landscape. But they really don't have uh, any special protection because they're just uplands. So they could be developed. And so we have to think about, you know, uh, how is, is that really an appropriate use um, for that area? Or should we be allowing the waters to um, move into those areas, provide habitat, and also provide um, flood protection and avoid costly uh, disasters and, and, and fixes down the road? So just to give an example of what that looks like to um, prepare these upland areas uh, for marsh migration. This is our STRAW program. Uh, STRAW stands for Students and Teachers Restoring a Watershed. And uh, they're restoring uh, levees and also uplands with dense native vegetation to benefit birds. And we uh, completed a study about this uh, and looked at some of the, um, some of what characteristics we need to benefit birds. And we found that wider levees are actually associated with uh, more, uh, with healthier tidal marsh bird populations. So if we can, when we're thinking about um, levees as part of, uh, as part of flood infrastructure, we need to be thinking about creating wide gradually sloped levees to best benefit uh, those tidal marsh birds when it's adjacent to that, um, to that habitat. So just to kind of summarize here, um, we're talking about flood protection and the benefits to important bird habitat. So that's really what nature-based uh, solutions is, is, is all about. And so I've showed you some examples of how tidal marshes uh, can be used uh, to buffer wave energy and also uh, provide carbon sequestration that um, Patty's going to talk about uh, in, the, um, in the presentation coming up. And also how wider levees can be restored with dense native vegetation uh, to provide cover from predators for important uh, endangered tidal marsh species. And uplands that can accommodate sea level rise and again buffer those areas um, adjacent communities to, uh, to floodwaters. And also that we need to remember that these managed wetlands, especially in South Bay, should be part of flood control systems and that they can provide benefits uh, to a diverse community of wetland birds. So it's important to think about what birds might be benefiting from those different uh, solutions. And thinking about that can also help uh, get funding for those projects by including um, birds in, as part of those solutions. So in summary, hopefully I've uh, convinced you of my key messages that the San Francisco Bay really is an important place for birds, that uh, that, that biodiversity is threatened by sea level rise and that nature-based uh, adaptation can really uh, benefit birds and people. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And now we can uh, move to our, our full panel. And we've got quite a lineup of questions here. The first question I see is from Evan Adams, who says, uh, for areas that are upgrading their levees, like Foster City, there's a frequent discussion over what happens on the borders of the levee. So the question is, what happens when you have a levee or seawall and then the next municipality over does nature-based adaptations? Does the levee become ineffective? I think that sounds like one for John. Yeah, I'll take, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, first, I wanna reemphasize a point that Julie made. Um, when I threw up that image of Manhattan with the wetlands around there, I, I threw it up as, as, to make the point that wetlands aren't appropriate everywhere. Right, and I think I think Julie uh, hopefully made that point more effectively than I did, and um, and you know, Foster City is kind of potentially one of those examples, right? Um, geomorphically, this, this is not a good place to put broad wetlands in in that area because Foster City that 
is built on what used to be the wetlands, right? So um, it's, a, it's a challenging situation. And, but as far as your comment about, you know, water doesn't care about your jurisdictional boundary, right? It, it does not care where the city line is. And um, Valley Water is a participant in an organization called CHARGE, which is the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Resiliency Group. It's a mouthful, but um, it was formed specifically for this reason to make sure that the flood managers around the bay are coordinated. And so that when we get to the boundary of a jurisdiction, that the flood protection strategies actually match up, right? You don't want one city, city A to be, you know, using a certain sea level rise projection or a certain model or a certain a set of assumptions and they build their levy here. And then the next jurisdiction builds their levy here and you get flooding through the back door. It, it, we really need to make kind of a seamless coordinated effort to make sure that we are um, enhancing each other's ability to be resilient to sea level rise and not throwing up obstacles. Uh, just because you're first out of the gate um, doesn't mean you know you could be pushing water onto someone else. You really need to have a coordinated effect. So um, if anyone in particular wants to uh, make use of charge as a resource to help with that coordination between jurisdictions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Or, um, or you can just Google charge, C-H-A-R-G, there's no E on it, charge SF Bay, and, um, and you can find us that way. So it's a, very, it's a very good question, and it's very important to make sure that we are treating this holistically, which again is why, and Julie, sorry if I'm stepping on your toes, that's why they came up with these operational landscape units, right? This is what fits in the landscape as far as, uh, you know, like a, like a watershed kind of concept, and it's not based on, on independent jurisdiction. Thank you, John. Uh, I believe this next question looks like one for Julie uh, from Ashley Eagle Gibbs who asked, has the Adapta Adaptation Atlas been applied to the outer coast beyond the San Francisco Bay and would the model be easy to scale in new locations? Yeah, thanks for that question. It has not, but the concept, you know, is not new. This is the same idea as littoral cells on the outer coast. What's the kind of unit that sediment is transported down the outer coast? So it's a concept that has been applied in other areas. The Puget Sound has a similar idea kind of for geomorphically managing the sound. Um, there's other ways of kind of regionally managing sediment movement in smaller bays around the country. So I definitely think it could be applied. We've talked to the, you know, San Mateo County and Marin County, you know, there's ideas of, could we expand this? I think this concept of managing our landscape by its climate risk could happen across the state or the country for any climate risk. Like there's a natural scale of management, I think that we could start working on. You could do this for uh, urban drought, issues. You could do this for heat island effect. You could do this potentially for wildfire. I'm getting way out of my lane because I'm not a wildfire person. But I just, I think the concept makes sense and I think could be used at multiple scales for multiple climate hazards. One thing I'll say, and this gets to what John was talking about, is that kind of the governance related to doing this type of work interjurisdictionally, to me, that's the big question of how do you scale this type of approach. What are the incentives? What are the drivers that it will, you know, besides that we know kind of it's the right thing to do or the, maybe the most effective or the, you know, the best for our habitats. I think there needs to be sort of a governance piece of this. How do we fund communities to work together? How do we fund community groups to be at the table? You know, and, you know, what is, what is the benefit that we get um, for asking people to work at this scale? Uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, next up, let's see which of you would like to take this one uh, from Sophie Hahn. Our cities and counties are all engaged in planning for huge RHNA housing and production requirements. Every community will be rezoning up in the next one to three years. This information needs to be incorporated into those plans. So how can we disseminate more broadly to jurisdictions? I'll start. And then I think Julie probably is going to have some input here. And, and I think that's part of the motivating factor behind this webinar series, I believe, um, James, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is exactly. exactly why they wanted to do this and why it's being recorded so that it can be shared. But I share, I share that concern because I served on my local planning commission and general planning committee. I went through arena update, a housing element update. So like, I, I know what goes into those plans and trying to fold in something like this um, with, the, with the pressure coming from the state to meet arena numbers, um, I know is challenging. Um, 
and and even even for me who's well versed in this stuff and part of the process it's still hard to get that that level of uh, of input and forethought interjected into those processes but but julie i know you've partnered with spur on the adaptation atlas and taken that out on, on a grand tour so i don't know if you have any thoughts yeah i think um you know we all tend to work in our silos and i think the issue of climate change and climate adaptation is requiring just a new level of coordination that's beyond what any of us have imagined. We partnered with SPUR on this, and I think that was really strong because they have such an expertise in policy and you know, city planning. Um, but what came out of it immediately was the need to work with the housing community. And I know the Greenbelt Alliance has started kind of reaching out and working with housing communities to, you know, we can't do nature-based adaptation along the shoreline if we don't have housing policy that's transit oriented. Um, how do we create the ability to work together? And I guess that gets back to my like governance question. Like I, I feel like if there was some carrot that said, if you work across jurisdiction, if you work with communities, if you work um, across sectors, you know, is there, is there any benefit to that? Like, is there a way to, to, to prioritize funding to communities that do that, that say, here's our housing plan and here's our shoreline adaptation plan. Again, you know, this is beyond what I know about, but I think there needs to be some reason to all work together. We know we need housing. We know that housing is a huge crisis. Um, so we can't just keep working in our lane and say, you know, I'm just going to keep planning my nature-based adaptation along the shoreline if I don't account for where people are going to live. The whole point of doing climate adaptation is so that we can continue to live and work in this area um, and have the benefits of access to nature, of biodiversity, like Julian talked about, um, the wildlife that makes this area so dynamic and why we all live here. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. I can keep talking about this. <laughs> Thank you to you both. Uh, next question is from Laura Baker. It says, while we are concerned about too much seawater intruding, we are also facing decreasing freshwater inflows from our streams and rivers, both uh, natural and human-based causes. It says, how does this planning approach address this increasing change in the balance? Yeah, I mean, this we were asked specifically to talk about sea level rise, so that's kind of why we've been focused there. But that, the the tidal fluvial interplay is really complex. Um, you know, you get down to the edge of the bay, and it's really it becomes very hard to tease apart. Um, you know where one begins and the other ends so it, it is it is a complicated issue and i believe you know with climate change there's a, a you know there's uncertainty about sea level rise projections there's even more uncertainty about i think how it's going to affect the the fluvial systems right um, the timing of rainfall the amount the flashiness of the system all of these things are still a little un, unclear as to how uh, it's going to affect things and then on the on the other side of it too i think we also need to keep in mind that as we start to build levees and walls, you know, nature-based solutions or not, um, you know, you've got water coming down the slope toward the bay. And so you have to accommodate for that, those fluvial, you know, systems getting around and up and over and out to the bay. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. Um, we didn't really, there are people working solely on that. Julie, I don't know if you, or Julian, I don't know if you have anything more to add, but um, I'm not as well versed in those issues. Yeah, one of the, um, you know, one of the big messages of the Balin goals and of um, the idea of the operational landscape units is to take a watershed approach. And so while the, the adaptation analysis itself focuses on the edge of the bay, you know, it's connected to the watershed. And so one of the, um, you know, SFEI just came out with a new report looking at sediment availability in from each watershed under a series of climate scenarios. So in a drier climate, in a wetter climate, what is the amount of sediment that will come down these systems that is available? And also what is the need at the bottom? Um, and this gets to the idea that like, maybe we can't do these ideas everywhere. How do we prioritize? How do we get the sediment we need? And how do we reconnect our watersheds to the edge of the bay? Because that's a major source of delivery of sediment. At the same time, I think as the question alludes to, it may be that we don't have as much inflows. And so, you know, as our seas rise, our head of tide moves upstream and that will move upstream differently. In some watersheds that are steeper, it won't move as far. In some areas like those wide alluvial valleys, our head of tide might move miles inland. And that really impacts um, the habitats, it impacts our flood patterns, it impacts 
um, how we manage those systems. And so, you know, I think the big takeaway is we need to manage at the watershed scale and the operational landscape units help break that down into manageable bites. Um, watershed planning is a long thing that we've done for a long time, um, but it's very hard because it also crosses jurisdictions. So um, lots of challenges. Uh, this next one looks like this for Julian uh, from Emily Beach writes, can you comment on tidal marsh birds interacting with restoration projects near SFO airport and safety concerns for both birds and aircraft? Are there some restoration projects that are less attractive to birds? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and airports typically don't like to have large flocks that darken the skies um, next to their, uh, at the ends of their runways. Um, one thing I will say though, is that, um, some of the wetlands like the tidal flats and the open waters that they can attract large numbers of birds and that can be an issue that uh, for airports. Um, I will say that tidal marshes, they don't necessarily attract flocking birds. Those birds that I showed um, on, on the screen there, the song sparrows, the ridgeways rails, uh, the black rails, um, they tend to stay down in the vegetation. They don't flock in large numbers. So I think that tidal wetlands is would, would be appropriate for that area. Um, of course, it could be kind of hard to get tidal wetlands immediately without going through that transition of tidal flats um, to uh, low marsh. But that's something that um, that can be considered. And, that, and it might just be involved moving earth to get the site uh, at tidal marsh level right away to speed that. If I could. If I could jump in on that too, because that's, that's exactly what we did um, on the inner Bear, Bear Island restoration um, in Redwood City. It's right adjacent to the San Carlos airport, like literally the runway is right adjacent. And so we did an analysis of all the bird strike data over the past couple decades. And we looked at the species of birds that triggered the bird strike, you know, the, the, what, what were the species, if it was discernible. And it really is these larger flocking birds. Um, a lot of the smaller marsh birds were not a concern. So we actually imported material so that that marsh would be at the right elevation to vegetate almost immediately. So you wouldn't have that attractive nuisance at the edge of the runway. So yeah, it, airport bird strike, it's, it's an issue, um, but there, there are ways to think about it and, and try and work around it. Thank you. Let's see who would like to take this one. Uh, it's from Susan Lesson who writes, I live in Foster City is currently building a vertical levee on the bay. How do horizontal wider marsh levees integrate with San Francisco Bay vertical levees? Uh, so if I'm understanding the question, so there's the idea of a horizontal levee is that there's a flood risk levee at the core of it. And so you've got that same engineered structure, but instead of a three to one slope, which is what most flood risk levees have, it has a slope that's something like 30 to one or 15 to one. And so it grades out farther into the bay. It takes up more space. And that is one of the issues about nature-based adaptation measures is they take space. Um, but the benefit is that you have a connection to the marsh plain. It grades down so that when we're talking about migration over time, that marsh that it's connected to can migrate up it. It creates a ecotone kind of a series of habitat types. Um, and when we think about a complete marsh or um, kind of a less, you know, a more complex and biodiverse marsh, that's one of the other benefits is that it allows for different habitat types, different vegetation, different species to exist along that slope. Um, and it also attenuate waves more. So it is, is more of an energy um, sink as opposed to a, um, you know, a, a levee where you think of kind of um, waves crashing into it and, and bouncing off of it. The other benefit is that it, um, it maintains the life of that levee. And so a lot of times there's a lot of maintenance that has to be done on riprap or levees that have a steep slope because you've constantly got waves pounding into it and eroding. Um, when you have a horizontal levee in front of it, you've got a lot more protection. And so there's benefits both for habitats and also for the infrastructure that we have behind it. Yeah, Julie, if I could just add to that, um, I think in creating these transition zones, these ecotones, horizontal levees artificially means bringing in fill, right? And that's the space that Julie was talking about. And so 
a lot of our, as I kind of alluded to in my, the beginning of my presentation, a lot of our policies and regulations have been developed around preventing people from filling the bay. And so here we are, we have these set of regulations that are discouraging and penalizing us filling the bay, even if we're doing it for beneficial reasons. And so uh, agencies like BCDC and the Regional Water Board, they're, they're reevaluating their policies in light of climate change and this sort of beneficial reuse of fill for these sort of ecosystem features. But it, it, in a place like Foster City where the, the placement of those features would have to be outboard of the existing levee system because you've got houses on the inside, um, that means fill in the bay, which means you'd have to mitigate and you're providing, you're impacting those mudflats that Julian talked about. So um, it, it really is a very site specific and not all nature-based solutions are appropriate in all locations. And I think that's something we want to make sure um, resonates with everyone. Thank you. Well, we have a very short but important question from Jan Fenwick who asked, why is there no sediment in the bay? I'll take a first stab at that, Julie, if, you're, if you want. So San Francisco Bay is a very shallow, very muddy bay. And it, the reason it is shallow and muddy stretches back to the gold rush era. So um, at, the, at the end of the gold rush, you may know that they, they were using more and more extreme methods to try and get at the gold. And they started doing what's called hydraulic mining, where they would bring in these giant water cannons and basically scour away entire mountainsides. Well, that created a huge pulse of sediment that moved down the delta and into the bay, and it really changed the composition of San Francisco Bay. And if I don't know if you remember from my presentation, I had this graph showing sediment dropping off. There's concern that we are just now seeing the tail end of that pulse of sediment move its way through the system. So, you know, 100 years later, um, or, you know, decades later, we're, we're finally seeing that pulse of sediment kind of uh, move through the system. And so when you add that to the fact that we are dredging and, and exporting material, we're treating dirt as a waste product instead of as a resource. Um, I think we need to change our mindset, both upland construction material, as well as dredge material. This is, this is a resource that is important for the marshes to survive and thrive, but that's kind of the leading. There's still some uncertainty about how much sediment uh, is is leaving the bay, uh, but there are scientists that are monitoring it, and that's that's one of the thoughts. Yeah. I'll just add in that um, SFEI's latest report is called "Sediment for Survival," and um, it has a great explanation of exactly what John just talked about, but also about what we expect to happen in the future and how much we need to treat sediment as a resource, how much is needed, how much is exported, and how much our valence need to keep pace with sea level rise. Thank you. Well. Here's a, a question with a few more words than that last one. This is from uh, Ken Branson in Senator Becker's office, who writes, the speakers have talked about tidal areas reducing wave action against levees, but what is the plan for dealing with places that are going to be below sea level or close enough for frequent flooding risk? Is the idea to put levees around all of these places and then use nature-based solutions to protect those levees better? Um, how do we deal with creeks flowing down into a rising bay? Do the levees need to extend up the creek beds to the point where the creeks will meet sea level in the future? Yeah, so there's a lot, lots going on in that question, but all really good questions. And, you know, there is not a plan. I mean, I, that's what's sort of scary about this. Um, I'll start by saying that BCDC has started working on, has over the last year or so, brought together many, many stakeholders in a program called Bay Adapt. And the idea there is trying to figure out what is our regional approach? How do we do this equitably? How do we make sure there's funding and policies and participation and you know, nature-based measures? How do we bring it all together? Because we don't have you know, the regional governance to make local land use decisions. It's all gonna happen at an individual level unless there's sort of a regional approach. Um, so that's just sort of <laughs> philosophically, I think what what hopefully will help a lot. In terms of areas that are below sea level, I'd, I'd say we don't talk enough about groundwater rise. It could be that groundwater is actually what we see first before overtopping of levees. And so in a lot of these low-lying communities, there's a huge risk of groundwater rising, of the impacts of that in people's basements, um, you know, our storm infrastructure not functioning properly. Um, a levee's not gonna help in that situation, unfortunately. 
or a seawall is not going to help. And so we need to think outside the box about what are our options in the near term to mitigate for all of the risks that we're going to see. Are there ways we can um, use wetlands, which are the natural expression of groundwater on the surface, to you know help help mitigate for groundwater rise? Do we have to raise houses? Do we have to move? Um, you know, there we have put ourselves in harm's way, you know, by building on top of wetlands and by subsiding our near shore, our areas that are near the shoreline. Um, so I don't know that there's a great answer for that, but I think un, in that in the, in the conversation of how do we transition from what's what our vulnerability is to what are our options, you know, we have a good sense of our vulnerability for sea level rise, but we're just now getting a handle on groundwater rise and increased fluvial flooding. Um, and the USGS is working really hard on integrating those um, so that our vulnerability maps then show all of the directions that water is coming to us from. Um, but I think we're, we're really needing to move more to that direction. But I think just asking that question, especially when we think about where are we building more? Where are we densifying? Where are we increasing our, our housing? Like let's, let's make sure we're not putting more people in harm's way. All right, thank you. So here's one, another for Julian. Um, birds are, the birds are so important. Uh, are you seeing populations of birds rebounding in areas of restored wetlands? Yes, that's a great question. And yes, and that, that's usually what I uh, present on. So entire presentations dedicated to that. But the short answer is, is, is yes, we are lucky here in the Bay that wetland restoration really does work. Most of the photos that I showed of these, you know, lush, vibrant, green tidal marshes, those were all, those are restored marshes. So uh, 20, 30 years ago, if I was standing in that same shot taking a picture, it would have looked like a very, a dry, um, a dry grassland, a hay field, essentially. So yeah, birds, birds do respond quite well to restoration here in the Bay. And then the follow up on that, could you give a couple of examples around the Bay where people might see uh, restoration efforts that have been particularly successful? Um, well, the most classic example is called uh, Carl's Marsh, and that's uh, on the Petaluma River, and you can access it uh, via that, um, you know, the Port of Sonoma area. Um, actually, a better, a better place with good public access would be the Sonoma Bay uh, Sorry, Sonoma Baylands, and that's in the uh, wildlife refuge in the north. So along along Highway 37, there's actually a, um, a great spot to take a hike. Uh, you can see on one side of the levee that you'll be standing on a restored wetland that's full of birds. It's got great habitat, and then on the other side, the more recently restored Sears Point, and that was the breach photo that I showed, and that's it in the early stages of restoring. So you can see both areas with these mud flats um, with uh, shorebirds and ducks in it in the process of, of becoming marsh and on the other side, uh, uh, fully tidal marsh. And, and of course, the South Bay salt ponds. Uh, there's the Eden Landing Complex. You can, that's, yeah, a lot of those areas uh, have been restored and are great places to go watch it in action. Right. That one's close to me, so I was hoping that was going to be mentioned also. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and following, you mentioned Petaluma, so we have a question from uh, John Shribs that says, in Petaluma, much of the historic wetland on the east side became housing and creeks channelized, so no more deltas, thus increasing sediment flow to river and now a higher cost of dredging. How can we change our current city policies to decrease sediment flow or use the sediment flow to regularly do more um, continuous dredging and delivery to needed sites? Right, so there are a lot of uh, areas in along the Petaluma River that can be restored to tidal marsh that are uh, effectively um, holders, like those low-lying areas that are flood prone. So it would be a great use of that sediment to um, put it in those areas and prepare that site, raise the elevations and prepare those sites uh, to become uh, tidal marshes. So that's, that's, that's one way to do that. And as far as how to get those policies enacted right beyond, beyond my league, but I think just uh, making sure that policymakers are aware of what can be done, what the possibilities are, what the benefits are, I think it will be a natural progression to 
uh, to codify that into, into policy. Yeah, which is really the whole point of this webinar series. So uh, make sure that your elected officials know about the series and um, and watch the recordings on our YouTube channel if, if they can't watch them live. Um, next, we have Christopher Hewitt, who starts with Awesome Julie. Is there any suggestion from the core with funding opportunities to help the local agencies with developing projects and address your uh, carrot to get all the agencies in the same room? What do you think about a restoration czar who would be able to corral the cats from the other federal, state, and local agencies? You know, there was a study a couple years ago by a professor at UC Davis, Mark Lubell, who did a, he surveyed a ton of people working in this field to say, do you want a restoration czar? Like, is that the answer? A big overarching agency to guide all of this. Um, what are the big problems with restoration and adaptation and what do we need? And people do, do not seem to want a restoration czar. I think that did not seem to be the answer. Um, I think we do need to figure out ways to come together. I don't know what that is. I, you know, I don't know that the core has the ability to do that, but I know the core wants to, I want to come to the table to make that happen or to kind of make collaboration um, more effective. Um, but in terms of kind of, the, I mean, you're getting at the major problem here, which is governance and funding. You know, I think there's a lot of science. There's a lot of willingness to have these conversations and talks about what we should do and how to prioritize. Um, and I think the big question is, you know, how do you facilitate that the type of collaboration that we know is needed? So John, you might have other thoughts that are more helpful than me just acknowledging that it's a huge issue. So thank you everyone for your comments. We need to take a short break now before we uh, restart. Uh, should restart in five minutes with our um, next series of presenters. Thank you very much. <laughs>